Hey, welcome everybody, wherever, wherever you are joining us from, I want to say a big welcome, thank you for being here today. If I haven't met you, my name is Josh, and my wife Janae and I serve as the lead pastors here at Evangel, and we're excited for fall. I told you it was coming, and here it is, here we go. I love fall, praise Jesus, all of you come back to church in the fall, it's awesome. Hey, I know there's many of you that are in the room today or many that are are watching from somewhere and you're just checking us out. You're just checking church out and I want you to know that you're welcome here. Uh, We're so thankful that you're here, that our church has prayed for you to be here and to be a part of things and uh, you're no longer a new or a visitor, but you're a part of the family and we truly mean that. We've set things up for you to be a part of this church family. So can we give it up for everybody who's maybe just checking things out, maybe for the first or second time. We're so glad, so glad that you're here. Hey, real quick, I want to give you, you know, many of you have been on vacation and maybe somewhere along vacation you took a vacation from reading your Bible. I know that it happens and uh, we have a, a plan that'll help you get on ba- back on track. It's something that we do all year at the church. It's called SOAP. SOAP is an acronym. It's a way to study the Word of God, to study your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, go to the Information Center, ask for one. I'm getting myself in trouble right now, but oh well. And, uh, and ask for one and we'll figure out a way to get you one. I uh, want to make sure that you have a Bible, but the, the acronym SOAP is read the scripture, S is scripture, observe what you're reading, like actually think about and meditate on what you're reading, don't just read it to get through it, figure out what you read that stands out to you and apply it, that's the A, apply it to your life, and then pray whatever it is that's sticking out to you, pray it into your heart, pray it Pray and ask God to make you more like the Word of God or like Jesus. And on the back of the bookmark, there's a plan for September. Uh, it's the, the book of John, one of the Gospels. I'm trying to do my best to preach out of the soap plan. So today I'm talking about John 2. Uh, it is a little bit into September, but you haven't missed a lot. You missed the birth of Jesus. Many of you already know how that happened. So just jump in uh, wherever we are in September. You can get these online at goevangel.org or out at the Information Center in the lobby uh, where you walked in. Want to make sure that you have soap in your hands. We're also starting <laughs> soap in your hands. There's also a lot of people here, so make sure you use soap. Uh, sorry. We're also starting a new series uh, called What a Mess, and we're looking at many of the areas of our lives that can get messy and can get out of order. And I don't know if you're uh, like us, we have a young family, we're, we're in our careers, there's a lot going on right now, and it seems like you get one area together and then you run over to the other area that's falling apart, and it's hard to like keep all of life in order. And I want to give you some practical tools, like soap, just real practical tools that you can utilize this fall that will help you to keep your life in order, that will help you to keep your spiritual life in order. And I'm going to start today with a message entitled, The Fight for First. And really, if we're going to bring order to our lives, then we have to know what is first, and we have to keep first things first. But before I talk about what's first, I need to make just a special announcement, specifically to the core of our church fam- family. Those of you that are members or partners uh, with Evangel, I need to let you know that in two weeks, on September 23rd, at 2 p.m., it's a Sunday afternoon, right after the noon service, we're going to gather together in this room, and uh, we're going to talk about and vote on a resolution to expand our campus. And uh, yes, it's exciting. It's going to be a, a great expansion. Um, part of the team that's helping us is here this weekend. want to welcome them, but, but need you to be here, need you to be engaged. You'll be getting some communication from me in the mail. But Sunday, Sunday September 23rd, 2 p.m., in this auditorium, uh, for all members and partners of Evangel, look forward to... Uh, having you here. Hey, if you have a Bible, open up to John 2. It's one of the Gospels of Jesus. It tells the story of Jesus. It's about two-thirds of the way through your paper Bible, but I know none of you brought that, or many of you didn't. So uh, go ahead and open your iPhone or open your phone to the Version Bible reading plan and, and click on John 2 and follow along with me as we look at a story from the life of Jesus. It says this. It says in John 2, verse 1, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, that's Mary, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Jesus says to his mother, woman, whoa, (laughs) you call your mama today and say, woman, (laughs) 
don't do it, don't do it. Especially those of you that are teenagers, don't do it. He says, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Verse 6, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants at the wedding, he said, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim with water. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. Boom, a miracle happened. For the first time, Jesus performs a sign that reveals the glory of his life, that he is both the Son of God and the Son of Man. He changes water into wine. The master of the banquet didn't realize where the wine had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Underline that in your Bible. Highlight it. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. I want to couple that today with what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, just two books of the Bible back from where we are in John. He says, but seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. He's saying, seek God first, and the rest of the affairs of your life will fall into order, will fall into line. He's really giving us an idea of what needs to be first in our lives. Towards the end of my college career, career, uh, I I started working at a local coffee shop. Uh, I began working there because I was broke as a joke. And maybe you say, Josh, how broke were you? Well, I went to Plato's Closet with a pair of blue jeans, and I said, can I sell you these blue jeans? I need to put gas in my car. And they said, we'll give you $2 for the blue jeans. And I said, sold. I sold a pair of blue jeans for two bucks. That's how broke I was. It was bad. And too prideful to call my parents and ask for money, but uh, I, I decided I needed to, to get to work, so I started working, and I worked at this local coffee shop, and uh, there was a conflict because I was a college student, or just out of college, and I still had some habits that I really enjoyed. Like, I really liked staying out late with a bunch of my friends or with my roommates. Uh, I really liked going for half-price appetizers, which start after 9 p.m., I, I went to this old thing, I don't even know what it's like anymore to be a part of it, but it's called the late movie, or like the late showing of the movie. I used to go to those, whatever those are, you know, the ones that start at 9.30 and you get home like midnight, when I'm not awake anymore. And, uh, and I, we used to do all these things, and they came into conflict with my new job, because as a part of my new job, I was what you call the opener. So 6 a.m., I drug my sorry carcass out of bed every morning and went and, and thank God that it was at a, a coffee shop, you know, with free coffee drinks because it kept me going. But 6 a.m., I had to be at work and I had this little uh, fight in my life about, you know, whether I was going to prioritize my coffee shop job or whether I was going to prioritize my social life. And so I tried to do both and I stayed out late and then I got up late for work like three times in a row. Getting to the coffee shop at 6.30, like people, customers are standing at the door wondering if anybody's inside. It seriously happened. I'm not proud of myself. And finally, my boss, this great lady who loved me like a son, said, Josh, from now on, when you get to work at 6 a.m. on time, you're going to call me and let me know that you're at work. It's like, this is degrading. I'm a farm kid from North Dakota. I'm supposed to have a good work ethic. This is just embarrassing and humiliating. But I did it. Every morning I drove to work. I got in at 6 a.m. I picked up the phone and said, Hi, Lynn, this is my embarrassing phone call because I'm not very good at adulting, letting you know that I made it to work on time. And Lynn, who, you know, got up at like 4.30 in the morning, she was one of those people, would say, Good morning, Josh. Have a great day. And I'm like, Yeah, you bet. (laughs) And for months, I'd make this this phone call at 6 in the morning. And really what she was doing was she was teaching me that this job is going to be a priority to you. 
that, that this is going to come first before other things that you want to put in front of it. And Jesus is really in a moment of transition similar where he's changing what's first in his life or, or he's maybe just teaching everybody else around him what is first in his life. The reason Jesus looks at his mother and says, woman, why do you involve me? By the way, the word woman in that day in that culture was polite and a term of respect. In our culture, not so much. Uh, but, but he says, woman, why do you involve me? Don't you know my hour has not yet come? He's essentially saying, mom, I love you, but I'm no longer on your schedule. I'm going to follow my heavenly father's schedule from now on. We see a, a picture of it when Jesus is 12 years old. His family accidentally leaves their 12-year-old behind. Some of you would just keep going. I know you would. But they turn around to go get their 12-year-old. And, and they go pick him up. And they find that he's teaching in the temple. And, and they say, Jesus, what were you doing? We were nervous. We left you behind. We were scared. We didn't know what happened to you. And he said, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? And Joseph is like, I thought I was your dad, you know? But he's saying, no, I had to be about my heavenly father's business. And now at this point in this story, Jesus is stepping into his ministry and he's establishing, I will be on God's schedule from here on out, not my parents. I will be on God's schedule from this moment on. See, we all have places in our lives where there's this kind of fight for what's first or this war over what you're going to be committed to, what's going to be first in your life, what is going to get the most attention, what's actually going to get in your time, the most of your time. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to, from this point forward, begin to be revealed as the Messiah or the Savior and Lord of the world, and I'm going to, I'm going to live on the schedule of my heavenly father. I'm going to be on a divine schedule. I'm going to be intent on obeying God's will for my life. Now listen, it's fall. School's in session. The Vikings are on in an hour. There's a lot of stuff <laughs> vying for your attention. If you're a Vikings fan like me, I got great hopes for this year. But I have a problem, because the Saints are pretty good, the Rams are pretty good, Carson Wentz is out there, so I'm just setting you up for the disappointment that's probably going to come. So anyways, <laughs> listen, I know there's a lot of things going on, there's a lot, there's, all of a sudden you're surrounded by vacation schedules and school schedules and the church schedule and and the Sunday afternoon football schedule, like all these really important things that are happening, the doctor schedule, whatever it is, trying to fit everything into your life. And maybe you've seen or heard this analogy before, but let's just say that this glass jar is the time that you have in a day, and there's so many things. Adulting is hard. Come on, can I get an amen? It's like, how do I, how do I raise the kids and have a great marriage and do my job and pay the bills all in one week? It's difficult. I'm still learning. I'm 32. Have grace for me. But it, it's like all these rocks symbolize parts of our day, like things that you got to do, you know, like I got to I gotta go get a coffee in the morning, you know, that takes 20 minutes. I got to go to work. I got to drop my kids off at school. I, I got to pay the bills at least once a month. You know, and then there's some uglier rocks in here, like I got to go on Facebook, you know, the ones I'm not proud of. I got all these things that I got to do that fill up my time each and every day. And, and you know that many days, there's not enough space for all the rocks. And Jesus is saying, no matter what you have going on in your life, seek first the kingdom of God. The biggest rock in your life that you need to move every day is moving your relationship with Jesus forward. It is the biggest and most important rock. But you know what I know about the biggest rock and the most important rock? is if you fill up all your time, you get up in the morning and you know what I do every day, I walk over to our Nespresso machine and I make myself a coffee and that takes a few minutes and I got to get my kids ready and try to help out as much as I, you know, I, they got all these things that I got to do. I should probably brush my teeth this morning, you know. Uh, I, I got all these things I got to do and pretty soon I start putting rocks in the jar and I get to the end of the day and it's 11 o'clock at night and I see Jesus and I'm like, oh, it's you or the pillow. And all of a sudden, I find out that the biggest, most important rock doesn't fit in my life. 
I, I, I made it on all the kids' sports schedules. You know, I, I did all the things that I was supposed to show up for. I, I made all my meetings, and yet I get to the end of the day, and still I didn't get the biggest rock in. Do you know how you always get the biggest rock in your schedule? You put it in first. It's the first thing. Before all the other rocks pile on, you put in the big rock, the most important thing. And what's amazing about this principle is he says, seek first the kingdom of God, put Christ first in your life, and some of these rocks aren't going to fit anymore. But maybe that's a good thing. Like maybe that's just the season of life that you're in that you got to let some of those other rocks go. Or maybe they're really important rocks and you know what God says because he likes you and he's in a good mood? He says, and all these things will be taken care of. Like, I'll just, I'll give you grace to get more done than you could have done if you hadn't spent time with me, if you hadn't put me first. I will give you grace to go beyond your normal energy level. If you will prioritize my schedule, I will help you with your schedule. When you prioritize God's schedule, he will provide for your schedule. We, we see this, there's something in scripture called reciprocating principles. It's one of the one of the principles of the, the kingdom of God, when we're a part of God's kingdom, there's areas where he says, if you will give me X, I will return it back to you. Some people look at following Jesus and say, man, it's so, I got to give so much up, or it's, it's so hard, or I can't do the things that I want to do anymore. God never takes anything away without giving you something better in return. Like we, in, our, in our services, we pass a bucket and we very straightforwardly ask you to give. Why? Because we know that 90% in, in your hands and 10% in God's hands is blessed. And you can do more with that blessed 90% than you could do if you kept 100% for yourself. It's a reciprocating principle of scripture that what you give to the Lord, he will return back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And if you don't know what that means, then you just wait a few weeks till the leaves fall off the trees, you put them in a bag, you press it down, shake it together, and find out how much more fits when it's blessed. How much more fits when it's under the hand of God. It's a reciprocating principle. He he says, if you give me your life, I will give you life more abundantly. I'll give you back something even better than what you gave me first. So what does it look like to be on God's schedule? If you and I are really going to shift away from being on our own schedule and saying, God, I'm going to prioritize your schedule in my life. The book of Psalms in chapter 119 and and chapter 1, they say, live according to God's word or meditate on God's word. This is why soap is so important. Because if if we're going to live according to God's word or we're going to meditate on his word, it means that we have to read it. That we actually have to open up our Bible and begin to engage with the word of God. And, and in that way, God's saying, get on my schedule. Matthew 6 says, you ought to pray, you ought to fast, you ought to give generously. He's saying, these are the things that people who are, are on my schedule will do in their lives. In John 15, he's saying, remain in me and I will remain in you. And you can look at that and say, wow, that's a really sweet cliche verse that they always use in church. But he's ultimately saying, if you will spend time with me, then the maker of heaven and earth will enter into your daily life and he'll spend time with you. That's the promise. If, if I'll give God the little bit that I have to offer as a, a, as a human made in his image, then he will give me the fullness of himself in return. That is a bargain, friends. We, we, with God, we, when we give an inch, he takes a mile and it's the best deal ever for us. That he always gives us back more Than we give to him. Let me give you some examples from Jesus' life of what it means to live on God's schedule. From Jesus' life in John 2, we see that Jesus, first and foremost, was a social person. Some of you are like, yeah, praise God. All the extroverts said amen. That Jesus was social, and part of being on God's schedule was simply this fact that Jesus was a people person. And maybe he actually was was a little bit introverted, but he prioritized being with people. That doesn't sound very spiritual, but let me, let me tell you about it for a moment. He had a friend named John the Baptist, and John the Baptist came declaring that Jesus was coming. He like paved the way for the Savior to come so people would recognize Jesus when he came. John the Baptist is living out in the wilderness. The Bible tells us that he ate locusts and honey. I mean, he's like a man's man, let me tell you. He had a beard for sure, and he's out in the wilderness. He's kind of a recluse, 
And, and he's, he's declaring that the Christ is coming. And people probably think he's crazy and all these things. And you see Jesus come. And Jesus doesn't live out in the wilderness. He doesn't deprive himself of everything. Sometimes we feel false condemnation because we don't live like John the Baptist. But Jesus didn't live like John the Baptist. Jesus came, and he's walking down the road, and he sees Zacchaeus up in a tree, and he says, you're rich, I'm going to your house for supper. So if those of you that are rich could just identify yourselves so the rest of us can invite ourselves over (laughs) this afternoon. I mean, that's not the point. Really, Jesus was reaching out to Zacchaeus saying, yeah, we're going to share a meal, but I'm I'm going to feed you spiritually in a moment. I'm going to come to your house and I'm going to, I'm going to dine with you. You're going to dine. You're going to have a meal with God. I mean, he was really setting him up for a spiritual encounter. But we see over and over and over again in Scripture that Jesus was a social guy. Think about it. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the key places that you always find Jesus is he's either at a party or going to a party. Or he's at a meal or telling somebody that they're about to have a meal. Or he's reclining at the table. What does that mean? Jesus invited people into his life and he didn't just eat with them. They laid back at the table, they played a game, they had a good chat, and they got to know one another. That was the nature of Christ. You can read about it over and over in the Gospels. That he was a social person. So we see in in this scripture, Jesus' mother is at the wedding, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Many scholars don't actually believe. I mean, Jesus and his disciples weren't known at this time. Nobody really knew who they were, except John the Baptist declaring who he was. Many scholars don't believe Jesus was actually invited to the wedding by the bride and the bridegroom. They think he was invited by Mary. And so he was crashing that's how social he was. I remember at our wedding, we were sitting at the head table watching people walk in the door like, oh, I think they're here for the meal. I didn't know they were coming. And that's okay, the more the merrier. But I think that's the feeling that the bride and the bridegroom had when Jesus and his disciples walked in. And maybe it's why they ran out of wine. I don't know. <laughs> There's a chance. But really, Jesus showed up. And even at this wedding, he showed up. And if you look at the full story, aren't you glad he showed up? Because he actually saved the bride and the bridegroom from embarrassment. In that day, if you ran out of wine, and it was a different kind of wine, it was, the wine was usually watered down three times and then, and then passed out, maybe because of expense, maybe to avoid and stay within Jewish law of not getting drunk. It was watered down. And they run out of wine. And literally, if you ran out of wine at an event like this wedding, you could be fined. And you could be in liability to your guests for running out of wine. So it's a serious problem that they've run out of wine. And so I'm glad Jesus showed up. And aren't there so many situations in scripture that we're just thankful that Jesus showed up? Aren't there so many moments in your life where you didn't know where the answer was going to come from and then somebody called or somebody stepped into your life or somebody put their hand on your shoulder and you're saying, thank God they showed up. I was thinking about some meetings that I was at maybe a year ago and we were all sitting around at these tables and somebody was talking and all of a sudden right in the middle of the meeting, a woman got up in the in the middle aisle and started walking out. And I know I'm a preacher. I'm like, okay, they're either offended or nature is calling, you know? And I'm just going to guess. I'm going to hope that nature is calling. And she gets up and she begins to walk out. And then halfway down the aisle, she just drops. And, you know, everybody freezes for a second. And then you can tell who uh, goes into fight mode and who goes into flight mode because all the flight people are like, And then about, you know, another group of people that are the fight people jump in and start to move tables and chairs out of the way. And two nurses run in and begin to assess this lady and they check her pulse and maybe they didn't uh, feel a pulse or or, uh, a heartbeat or she wasn't breathing. And they do CPR. She gets taken off to the hospital and she survives. I'm thankful that the nurses woke up that morning and said, I'm going to go to the meetings. I'm thankful that the nurses showed up. And in the same way, there's moments in your life and in mine where the moment that you walked in the room, you thought that you were just fulfilling an obligation. When Jesus walked in a room, he changed the environment. When Jesus walked in the room, he was not just thinking, well, I got to do this because, you know, this is what I'm supposed to do. And my wife brought me here. I got to be here. He didn't walk in the room that way. He walked in the room knowing at any moment God could say, Jesus, I have something for you. I have an assignment. And it's the same with your life. Church is not just for your part. It's not just for your attendance. It is for your participation. There's somebody here today that needs you to put an arm around them and pray for them. There's somebody here today that needs you to not just be assigned to having to be at church, but need you to be on God's assignment while you're at church. 
There's people that are, are taking care of my babies right now and your babies right now, and they're on assignment. And I'm so glad that there's people in our church that show up. You know, statistically, the, the, we find that people go to church maybe once a month or twice a month at most. And there's some of you that you're here every stinking Sunday. Every weekend, you show up, and I know because you sit in the same spot every week. <laughs> and you think I'm preaching, but I'm actually up here taking attendance. <laughs> Just kidding. But let's be, I, I want to ask you to re-engage this fall. I want, I, want to, I want you to re-engage in the life of the church, or maybe in the life of a ministry, like the UG, like Pastor Caleb was talking about, for young adults, or element students, or with kids, or if you're in prime time, or evangel men, or evangel women, to engage. Why? Because every time that you engage, you are set up for God to do something in your life, but it's not just showing up, because a lot of us show up just because we think we have to, or we show up just because it's a part of our routine. But it wasn't just showing up that really caused the miraculous to happen around Jesus. It was the fact that Jesus showed up and he was a servant. He showed up and he obeyed God in whatever moment God asked him to involve himself in. See, Jesus says to his mother, why do you involve me? But from that point forward, it would be his heavenly father that would tap on his shoulder and involve him. And you have a heavenly father who's tapping on your shoulder saying, you're not just at your workplace to get a paycheck and to work, you're there because I want to involve you in something. I want to involve you in people's lives. You're in your situation, you live in your neighborhood because God wants to involve you in something. There is a sense of such incredible purpose on every one of our lives that we miss simply because we sit and analyze our situations or we, we think so inward all the time that we forget that God has us exactly where he has us. You could have been born in 1920 or 1820 and you're alive in 2018 in your home, in your marriage, in your neighborhood, in this place for such a time as this because God wants to involve you in something. But it's not going to take you just showing up. It's going to take your yes at the moment that he taps you on the shoulder. Saying, God, I I will show up and I will be obedient. I will serve in the way that Jesus serves. So Jesus says to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. That's our job. Jesus says, do it. And, And you and I say, how full, Jesus. And we give them the fullness of our obedience. They fill it up to the brim. They showed up and they did what Jesus told them to do. And you know what the result was? They saw the miraculous. They were present, they were obedient, and they saw God work in their lives. So many people say, well, I haven't seen God answer my prayer. I haven't felt like I felt God's presence or like he's talked to me or I don't even know if God is there. Listen, the Bible gives us, uh, I'm not a very good mathematician, but it gives us an equation to see God work in our lives. If you will show up, you will be consistent, you'll be there even when nobody else shows up, and you'll be obedient at the moment that God speaks to you, you will see him work in your life. You will see the miraculous. You'll see him do, do things that, that maybe nobody else in the room is seeing. The servants go out. They've filled all these things up with water. All of a sudden, they all have this realization, my word, there's a miracle that took place. There's now wine where we poured in water. They go out to the wedding banquet, and they begin to pour out wine. And you know what the craziest thing is? Nobody else in the room knew a miracle took place. The only people that knew were those that followed Jesus and those that served. The master of the banquet didn't even know there was a miracle. You can be around the things of God and never participate in the things of God. You can be surrounded by God working in this room. There are miracles and stories of what God is doing in the lives of so many people here. And and you and I can live so insulated, thinking God isn't on the move. He's not working. He's not answering prayers. But come ask a prayer team member at the end of the service if they've seen God answer a prayer, and they'll tell you. Because they showed up, and they served, and they saw God answer. Every time somebody hands you an offering bucket, they're participating in the miracle of God's provision that's going to happen in your life. Every time that you give, you participate. Because you're not just showing up, you're being obedient to what Scripture says. And if you and I will show up and we will be obedient, we'll be servants, then we will see the miraculous work of God in our lives. I remember first kind of starting to dabble in serving in church before I was ever a pastor. And this, it it was a big joke for a long time, but a, a pastor asked me to be a youth leader at his church. 
And he says, yeah, it was the craziest thing because Josh gave me an answer. A year and a half later, <laughs> I showed up for college. He tapped on my shoulder right away and said, hey, would you be a youth leader for some students? And I said, I don't know. Let me think about it. A year and a half later, I came back and said, I want to be a youth leader. <laughs> really had to think about it, I guess. And I came back and he said, great, you're going to lead sophomore boys. I'm like, great, like 16-year-olds, the one time in my life where I had no idea what I was doing, and I was probably the most lost I'd ever been up to that point. Like, sign me up, I'll tell them how to live. <laughs> here's the plan, guys, here's what I did. Do anything besides that, okay? Just go. And I started coming into this, this youth service like we have at the element, and with all these students and all these sophomore guys, and man, it was so lame. Because we'd, you know, we'd hear this great message, and then we'd go sit in a little group and, and talk, like in a connect group kind of setting, and, and right away, one of these sophomore guys would start talking about comic books, or video games, or teenage girls, or like all these other things where I'm like, this is just, this is dumb. Like, why am I here? I could be at a late show movie right now. <laughs> But I showed up, week after week, showed up. Didn't feel like anything was happening, but I showed up. And I led that small group. I served. I didn't know if it was making any difference. I was pretty sure I was just wasting gas money that I didn't have. And then one day at the end of the service, the pastor kind of gave a response time, and one of those sophomore boys walked around the chairs and my alarm starts going off. He's coming your way. What are you going to say? He might be crying. You know, oh no. <laughs> and sure enough, tears kind of running down his face. And he walks up to me and says, Josh, will you pray for me? Like, uh, sure, what about? <clears throat> Took off the veil of all the things he had been hiding and just poured it out. Next week, another student does it. Pretty soon, our little small group becomes this place of vulnerability and life change and growth to this point where we did what we called six weeks of fire and all the guys like um, shut off their computers and didn't use their computers for six weeks and read their Bible straight for six weeks and had all these disciplines that they did. They were just like moving forward in their faith today. They're young men who are in great marriages. They're, they're raising their kids. They're involved in great churches and they're all serving Jesus. What a legacy. Not because I was qualified. Not because I'm Pastor Josh, because I wasn't. And I didn't even have my life together when I started that. I still don't have my life together. <laughs> but because I showed up and I trusted God and I was obedient at the moment he gave me opportunities. And I got to participate in the miraculous. I got to see students have victory in their lives. And I'm telling you, Sure, the church needs you to participate because we need you to give. Sure, the church needs you to participate because we always need more team members, but you need to participate. Because when, when you go away from just showing up and being around what God is doing and serving, maybe out of a sense of obligation, like, well, I'm a Christian, I better do it, or maybe there's this divine scale, and if I do enough good, I'll go to heaven, but if I do too much bad, so I better serve because that's probably in the good category. That's a load of bull. Because Jesus died so that you would know where your salvation is. That you would know where your eternity is. But it's a whole different thing when you show up, you're obedient to God, and you experience something. You experience the miraculous. You walk around serving wine that you know 10 minutes ago was water. You know what the wine is symbolic of in scripture? Transformation. Transformation. Jesus says, I'm going to pour out new wine. I'm going to transform your life. The Bible tells us on the night Jesus was betrayed and crucified, he handed his disciples a cup of wine. He said, this is the covenant of my blood. It was a transformation from an old covenant of law to a new covenant of grace. An old covenant of the blood of animals as sacrifices to the blood of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, as the one sacrifice for all sin for all time. It was the transformation. And today, Jesus wants to pour new wine into your schedule. And he's saying, if you'll get on my schedule, I'll work through your schedule. And today, for some of you, Jesus wants to pour new wine into your soul, into your inner being, into the person that's hid behind 
the veil of your clothing and your appearance and your haircut and your, your personality, but the actual inner person, the spiritual being that's within you. And today Jesus wants to pour new wine into that place in your life. Look what happens. The result is in verse 11. It says, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him because they showed up, they served, and they saw the miracle. And when they experienced Christ, they were never the same again. And you know what the Bible tells us today? That Jesus did great signs and wonders in Scripture, but the things he has in store for us far exceed all that he did even in in Scripture. That he has signs and wonders and parts of his glory that he wants to reveal to you today that's greater than the disciples saw it. That's more fantastic than anything that you've ever thought or imagined. And today, God wants to pour new wine into your spirit. He wants to pour new wine into your schedule so that you can partner with him and see Jesus lifted up on the earth. So that as someone made in the image of God, you'll live a life that gives praise back to him. Would you stand with me? All over this room, if you just close your eyes for a moment. Some of you in this place, you're saying, Josh, I need a transformation on the inside. I don't even know maybe what that means. But you're saying Jesus can take what was old and take it out and pour in something new. Come on, friend, maybe you've known Jesus a long time, but you know it is a dry and weary place where your soul exists right now. Or maybe you've just not had relationship with him or you've never known what it was for the grace and the mercy and the very presence of God to be poured into your being. People refer to it. They walk in this room and they say, man, I walked into Evangel and I just felt like I was home. You know what they're saying? I felt the presence of Jesus and something lifted in my life. They're saying, man, I just felt the love that I had never experienced before. No, they're encountering the presence of God and he's here and he wants to pour something new into you today. If that's you today, with every eye closed all across this place, would you lift your hand with mine? Say, Josh, I need Jesus to pour something new into my heart. Man, hands all over. Come on, just lift him high and proud. It's not people that you're impressing right now. The Heavenly Father is impressed with you. He's impressed with you responding to him, with you acting upon what he's doing in your heart, with you taking what's on the inside and revealing it on the outside. Father, right now, I pray in this place that you'd pour a new wine into the hearts of these that are responding. Lord, that the old would be cast away and the new would come. Lord, that where there's been despair and discouragement, there would now be hope. God, where where there's been bondage, God, that you would bring freedom right now in this place. God, we don't ask on our own behalf, but we come before the very presence of God, the very throne room of God, because Jesus said we could go there. And Lord, we ask that you would break through in our lives, that you would pour something in that's new and fresh right now. Come on, all across this place, if you're saying, I just need to experience God in a new way, I need God to pour something new into my schedule or into my life. I want him to open my eyes when I read scripture so I understand it more and I can apply it. Whatever it is, if you're just hungry and you're saying, God, I need you to feed me in a way that my physical appetite could never feed me. Would you lift your hands with mine as a way of just responding, saying, Jesus, I surrender to you today. God, I don't hope in myself. I don't hope in my methods, but I know that hope has a name, and that name is Jesus, and I put my trust in him today. Come on, let's sing together. We're so glad you joined us today. Our hope is that you're challenged and encouraged by these teachings every week. We'd love to hear how God is using this ministry to change lives. Send us an email at mystory@goevangel.org. For more information about our church, check us out online at goevangel.org.